All eyes were on focus on the White House to see if President Biden would bend to the will of climate activists with respect to approving more LNG export capacity. Well, of course he has. Uh, our CO2 emissions have begun to plunge big time. This is China and India's are ramping even higher. And, and we're, we're there because of natural gas. I want to bring it out of the Bonson Group Managing Director, David Bonson. And David, just, it's just, you kind of knew and saw it coming, but it was like a slow motion, uh, slow motion train thing. You're like, please, it's, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? What's funny politically is that he wants to be able to brag that he's increased export LNG so much. We've exported a lot more LNG the last couple of years because of the Russia situation with Ukraine and so desperately needed. He can't brag about it if he's taking actions like this to stunt it and stop it for the future. And, and it doesn't help anyone. I mean, no. this, this is, it's not only has it helped with our, you know, listen, if you want a bridge between fossil fuels and whatever you think can, can run the world in the future, uh, it, it has to be natural gas. And a lot of reasonable environmentalists on the left acknowledge that. Um, by the way, it helps one person, Vladimir Putin. Yeah. Because that really ultimately is what this is about. We can be selling to Asia, to Europe, and disintermediate Putin as far as their dependency on right. Russian oil and gas. Uh, but it is not a bit major contributor to CO2. It is far cleaner than what is going to replace it, which right. is going to be more coal burning. So our allies have to either get fossil fuel, you know, uh, crude oil, or coal. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, how dumb exactly is that? And, and, and really, building these terminals is such an economic boost as well. It's yeah. a huge job creator. So this is a mystery to me, both in terms of the environmental side, the economic side, and geopolitical. All right, so let's talk uh, dividend, dividends. I know you like talking dividends. Um, so I, I, uh, in the last year, a lot of dividends have become, you know, gotten a, negative, a lot of negative press, right? Mm -hmm. They're saying on one hand, hey, if you want yield, you know, get you buy some uh, treasuries or money markets. You can get five percent there. On the other hand, if you're looking for your principal to increase, you know, you want to go there. And it's and that's sort of under underscored with these aristocrats. I know that. So the aristocrat index took three stocks out yeah. uh, here in this month. Wiley, which is down 21 percent in the last year. Uh, New Skin down 56 percent in the last year and Walgreens down 38 percent in the last year. Now, you've always had a beef anyway with trying to index this stuff. It can't be indexed. It's by definition. Dividend growth is not a product. It's not a tactic. It's not a trade. It's a philosophy. And we believe that you have to be doing the research to evaluate the propensity for dividend cuts. So we're very bottom up, value oriented. And yet we want to avoid those dividend cuts. And the indexes are backward looking. And you mentioned mentioned three recent examples of a blow up. But over the years, some very significant stocks ended up becoming huge dividend cutters back around the financial crisis. Bank of America, you had General Electric. Uh, and so we want to avoid those things like the plague. But you know, it's funny. Um, I believe that the aristocrats last year were obviously less than the index when the index had seven big names up. But then the year before, a lot of the aristocrats were down when the, it was a bad year for the market. They're supposed to be a huge right, outperformance. Right, right. Active dividend growth. I mean, obviously, I'm going to talk my own book, but other active managers, too, were up in 2022. And so you have the ability to have been up in a bad year and then up far less than the, the aristocrats. Uh, uh, By the way, for what is worth my dividend play for the year is Hershey's. That's, that's yeah. mine. It's not a large dividend, but I love it's like two and a half percent. And I like it. So overall market, before I let you go, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your, your thoughts. I had Gunlock on yesterday. He's really concerned. He says he feels like it's getting euphoric. I had Ed Yardini this morning. Yeah. He's like, this is just the beginning, baby. Let the good times roll. Yeah, Yardini is a little more credible to me. I like Jeff a lot as a bond manager, but I have a real hard time with uh, famous billionaires that keep coming on TV telling us how bad it's going to get for the eighth time. Now, they, they, they could be right the ninth time, but I mean, he's been saying this for a couple of years. And it's not just him. You have these Michael Burry and, uh, and Drunken Miller and other guys. They're just wrong constantly. And they basically are the only people who seem to have lost money last year. So In my opinion, the market as an S&P weighted index is very expensive. And we're not index investors, but there's certain pockets. You mentioned Hershey, that consumer staples. Look at what Procter Gamble did this week. You're going to see Cora. You're seeing the consumer staples. They've already had good pricing power. Now the volumes are coming. Right. Now you're going to see an increase of volume, and they're holding their margins. Right. There's good pockets of value in the market, but I wouldn't buy the whole index that's dependent on basically less than seven companies now. I hear you. Tesla's about to get kicked out of the magnificent <laughs> seven. Everyone's trying to change the name of uh, uh, the superlative six or whatever. Yeah, it's, well, it could end up being the Uno NVIDIA. <laughs> so.
All right. Have a great weekend, man. It's Thanks, always Thomas. great having you on the show, David.